Hey friends, welcome back. If you're new here, my name is Steph, and today I'm going to show you how I made this two-tier gluten-free Lambeth-style birthday cake for my sister's 30th birthday. The bottom tier was a six-inch, three-layer gluten-free vanilla cake. The recipe for that is on my blog if you guys wanted to take a look. And my sister requested chocolate buttercream, and then I, of course, had to fill it with ganache for that extra rich flavor. So I covered that first layer and then piped a dam of frosting around the edge so that I could fill it with ganache and it wouldn't seep out the edges. Then I added on the next layer... And because our AC was broken while I was working on this cake, I just smoothed it a little bit and then I put it in the freezer to set because at this point the icing was already starting to get pretty soft. Then I continued on adding more frosting on top of the second layer and smoothing that out before piping another dam of frosting. I use any open star tip. I find the stars work best because the ridges help to hold it in place. Filled that circle up with nice big scoops of ganache as well and then topped it off with the third and final layer for this base tier. Typically, I freeze my cake layers, and I really wish I had this day because of the whole AC issue, but I didn't, and that's just because I was at my parents' house. Their freezer is very small, and it's very full. So I was working with fresh room temperature cake layers, which can be a little bit more difficult because the buttercream doesn't set as fast. So I had to take my time and make sure I let it set either in the fridge or the freezer in between a lot of the steps. Now that I've stacked all three layers, I'm just adding on a bit more frosting to get my crumb coat done. A lot of people often comment things like, wow, that's so much frosting. But I think what people don't realize is that not all of the frosting I put on stays on the cake. I like to put a lot on at first to get full coverage, but then I scrape, honestly, most of it off with the cake scraper as I'm smoothing the sides out. You'll see that especially here with the crumb coat. You can see the cake actually peeking through here. So it's a very, very thin layer of frosting to start. And then when I do the top coat, I load on a bunch on top. But again, all of that frosting is not going to stay on the cake. I spread it around the top and then push it down the sides. And as I use my cake scraper to smooth out the sides of the cake, I'm pulling frosting off with it. And then I put that in a bowl off to the side. You can't see it on camera, but you'll see me do the motion of, of removing a bunch of the frosting. The final layer is no more than a centimeter thick, I would say. And then, of course, if you feel like that's even still too much frosting for you, there's semi-naked style cakes where you scrape it down and it kind of looks like just a crumb coat. Or even a naked cake where you don't put any frosting on the sides at all. You only have the frosting in between the layers. But what I think is happening is people that say it's too much frosting have never had a good frosting. And to be fair, there's a lot of crappy ones out there that are way too sweet, they're oily, they just taste like butter or lard. So my tip to you guys is try a new frosting recipe. And then, I mean, of course, if you still don't like it, don't make yourself eat it. Go for a semi-naked or a naked style cake. All right, moving on. This is the bottom tier. It is done. I'm going to put it in the fridge and let it set and get it nice and solid while I work on the top tier. This top tier was just a tiny four-inch cake top tier ended up only being about four servings. They were generous servings. So it didn't add that much value per se to the cake, but I really wanted to make a two-tiered cake because it was my sister's 30th birthday, which is a big milestone, and I wanted it to be a little bit extravagant. So all the steps here are the same as for the base tier. Lay out the first layer, spread a thin layer of buttercream, pipe my frosting dam around the edge, fill with ganache, and add on the next layer. Repeat that until I've done all three layers, put it in the fridge to set, and then continue on with the crumb coat and the final coat. If you guys are looking for a buttercream recipe, mine is available on my shop in my website, and I also have my buttercream guide there, which is essentially like the textbook of buttercream. It's got the recipe, a video tutorial, a bunch of tips and tricks, different options for flavoring it, and tips and tricks on how to color it, because I know that it can be really difficult to get rich colors like red and black with your buttercream. And then it also covers a lot of the common problems and how to fix them. So if you struggle with your buttercream and you just can't quite get it right, go check that out. It's on my website in my shop. Okay, now back to the current cake. I had a few people ask me if it was me who's allergic to gluten or if it's my sister, and the answer is that it is her. I cannot say that if it wasn't for her, I would have ever gotten into gluten-free baking because I've heard so many bad things about it, to be honest. It can be really difficult, and a lot of times things don't turn out the way you want them to. It doesn't work to just substitute gluten-free flour for regular flour in like a normal recipe. So you have to develop a whole new set of recipes, which can be a challenge. And for a lot of people, it's just not worth the effort if they don't need to. So if it weren't for my sister, I'm willing to bet I wouldn't have developed these recipes. But now I have, and I have them in my repertoire, and it's really nice to be able to offer more selection to people based on their dietary needs. The recipe for this gluten-free vanilla cake is actually up on my blog because I feel like I finally got it right after testing and testing. It's fluffy, it's moist, it's flavorful. It tastes almost the same as a regular gluten cake. But I won't lie to you and tell you that there's no difference because you can tell there's a subtle difference. All right, it is time to stack the tiers. Ideally, you want to stack with the cake layers really cold, but like I said, our AC was broken, so I got these little fingerprints on the cake when I brought it up. Even though I used parchment paper and had it chilling in the fridge for like an hour, my hands were just too warm. 
Thankfully, I was able to just go through with a scraper and smooth it out a little bit. And then I wasn't too worried about the little gaps at the seam of the two tiers because I knew I was going to be covering them with piping anyways. Otherwise, I could have added a little bit of frosting and then gone into the cake smoother and scraped it out to make it a nice clean surface again. Now we're getting into the fun part, the piping. This was a bit of a nightmare in such a warm environment. You can see how glossy and shiny the frosting is. And that's just from it being 32 degrees and my hands being warm. So I had multiple piping bags going and I was rotating them in and out of the fridge along with putting the cake into the fridge between nearly every step. That way it wouldn't get totally melty and start sliding and fall apart. Doing the fine lines like this was super difficult with the buttercream being so soft. Normally I can kind of let it hang and just pull it over point to point, but that wasn't working today because it was just breaking. So I had to pipe it directly on, which means it didn't look quite as smooth. But that's okay, we made it work. At the top, I tried a bit of a new technique, doing those half circles with a small open star tip. And I do really like how this one turned out. So this will probably be in my repertoire from now on. You might be noticing that these chocolates all look like they're different shades and that's on purpose because I wanted to do Lambeth style and I didn't want it to be monochrome. I wanted it to be a little bit more exciting and I was all torn up about it because I was thinking at first to do a bunch of different colors, but my sister had said she wanted chocolate frosting and I could coat the cake in chocolate buttercream and then do a very thin layer of vanilla buttercream to get those colors in. But Lambeth cakes require a lot of piping and if I wanted these to be colored, all the piping would have to be in vanilla and I think that was just gonna introduce too much vanilla flavor into the cake when she had requested chocolate. So it was actually my dad's idea to just go with different shades of brown. So there's still a little bit of variety, but without having to sacrifice the flavor. Because as you should all know by now, I'm a flavor first baker. That's also why I don't use fondant and why I try to make sure that almost all of my toppers are edible. I like to decorate with things that are the flavor of the cake. So like, let's say I do a chocolate strawberry cake. I like to put chocolate covered strawberries on top. I find it odd when people decorate with things that aren't in the cake. Like for example, I done a vanilla bean cake with fresh strawberries and someone suggested putting coconut on it. Now, maybe vanilla, strawberries, and coconut is a flavor that they like, but to me, that's a terrible combo. But they had only suggested the coconut because they thought it would be a good texture, like for the aesthetic. And I will never do that. I'll never add something just for the aesthetic if it doesn't fit with the flavors of the cake. You know what I mean? Like even those super cute maraschino cherries that people put on, I don't want to put those on a cake unless it's like a black forest cake and it has the cherry flavor already. This might be something that will evolve as I grow as a cake decorator, but for now, I like to keep things the way that it is on the inside, showcased on the outside. If you're wondering who those people are wandering around the background, that would be my parents. They were helping to prep my sister's birthday dinner. The way we do things in our household, we don't go out to eat on your birthday. You just get to select whatever you want for the family to make for you. And my dad is an amazing cook and I have turned into a pretty good baker. And then my mom is the queen of side dishes and organization and making the table look really nice and just kind of setting things up. So we've got hospitality, main course and dessert covered. Having a birthday around here is pretty special. Getting to the end of this cake, I wasn't sure if I should be adding more. I didn't want to add too much because you can't really take it off. I really like how things looked when they're layered and layered and layered, but I felt like I was kind of reaching its limit. So I just did one more tiny little border along the bottom and then decided to call it there. And then I put the cake back in the fridge to chill for a couple hours to make sure everything was set up nicely. Normally, I would recommend taking your cakes out of the fridge about an hour before you want to eat them because they taste best when they're at room temperature because they're made with butter and cold butter has no taste. It's got to soften up a little bit. But because of our AC issues, I took it out only like half an hour before we were going to eat it. It softened up perfectly. It was absolutely delicious. I really like how the piping turned out. I'm very proud of that, even with the struggles with the heat. And a treat for you guys, because I got to eat this one, I got a video of me slicing it open. My dad took this video for me, so thank you, dad. We'd already eaten the top tier. This is me just grabbing a slice of the bottom tier, where you can see all three layers and that lovely silky ganache filling. A lot of work, but oh so worth it in the end. Thanks for watching, and if you like my videos, you want to see more recipes, decorating tutorials, etc., please like and subscribe. See you next time, and happy baking!